tonight. Well, still ahead, 2020 has obtained film the Army didn't want you to see. Some test results of their million-dollar infantry carrier. Are the soldiers safe? But next, Robin Leach, the force behind lifestyles of the rich and famous. Why is he the one they trust? Bob Brown reports right after this. Wherever they are, whatever they're doing, he gets them to show us how they live. Bob Brown with a man living off the rich and famous when 2020 continues. It takes a leader, a hero, a zealot, a statesman, a victim, a pioneer, a crusader, an artist, a humanitarian. It takes someone special to be person of the week. Tomorrow, watch ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. For as long as there have been rich and famous people, there have been others who are fascinated by them. Where they live, what they wear, the cars they drive, the people they love. To tap that appeal, there are now a number of TV shows that boast opulent settings and wealth beyond compare. But if you want to know about the lifestyles of the real rich and famous, then you turn to Robin Leach. In fact, to keep up with the millionaire Joneses, we're told that loyal viewers include the likes of David Rockefeller and Malcolm Forbes. What is all the fuss about? And how did Robin Leach carve out this little industry for himself? Well, Bob Brown caught up with him, barely. Hi. Hi. Morning. 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 So we arrive in Nassau at 10.10. February is over. So we leave on Tuesday morning. There must be a direct flight from LAX to Rome and back. Okay. Now, the next morning, I've got to do Runaway and Fame Fortune before we do the normal shoot. Like 10.30 at night. And when are we going to do the shoot with Sophia Loren? This is Thursday. Thursday, correct. We do the shoot on Friday with Sophia. Yeah, what time will I be on the boat? What time is the flight from now to the It's a thankless job keeping up with the rich and famous, but somebody's got to do it. And for the last three years, it's been Robin Leach, dashing through airports, never checking his bags, catching the next jet to Nassau or Paris or Rome, to craft a schedule around lunch with Liz, cocktails with the Countess, supper with Sophia, or if nothing else is happening... Old-time horror movies with a Bloody Mary special at 12 midnight. Neither champagne nor cake nor caviar will stay him from his appointed rounds in the bathrooms, boudoirs, and beachfront hideaways of the people who every week guide Robin and his viewers like warriors through Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. With Leach's host, Lifestyles was first syndicated to television stations around the country three years ago, fueled by Leach's belief that audiences are less interested in the philosophies of the rich and famous more interested in their parties and possessions. Hey, whose Ferrari is this? It's mine! The success of that show led to spin-offs titled Runaway with the Rich and Famous and Fame, Fortune, and Romance. Between those three shows, not counting the specials rating the world's best restaurants and resorts, Robin Leach will appear in more than 11 million households each week a cockney cult figure relentlessly practicing what his critics call jacuzzi journalism. We make no pretense. Our show is entertaining. The bottom line mission, make money, make money out of entertainment. Your show has gotten a lot of ridicule. I mean, there are people who say it's nothing more than trash. That doesn't upset me because I think it's the best trash there is on television. Um, I am not in the business of brain surgery. I am in the business of fluff. We don't take what we do very seriously, but we do do it very seriously. Just 12 miles west from Tahiti, our platinum pick in the Pacific is Mariah. Celebrity For a man who in his own home is relaxed and poised and low-key, 
Leach in a studio, reading the narrations for his shows, suddenly springs into that voice that seems to freeze your television dial on his show faster than you can say Masterpiece Theater. Bet your bottom dollar America's top hotels are also New World's best contenders. I sort of developed that style that's become a little shrieking somewhere between um, a little north of um, Howard Cosell and a little south of my adenoids. Um, but it made me realize that um, not so much shouting, but enthusiasm, um, can make something sound perhaps a little larger than life. We are dealing with material on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous that is larger than life. It's almost unbelievable. It's the world's only marble top extension table. It took 15 craftsmen a year to build. Guests paid $10,000 a table, then smashed the place to bits every night. In the midst of this spectacularly rugged country surrounding Lake Taupo, sits And one if of the you're still not resort, paying attention, Leach will grab you by the ears with one of his favorite narrative techniques, describing the world in bursts of alliteration. How, since you were there, is it fish filled? Uh, yes, it is. Trout, trout filled, actually. Would. Trout filled, trout. Trout tossed. Trout tossed, trout. Is there a, an alliteration instead of filled, Jeffrey, for trout? Teeming with trout. It's the luxurious Fuca Lodge, acres. stretched out over 17 beautiful acres on the banks of the teeming with trout Waikato River. Down in merry old England, second only to Well, how did Robin Leach happen to send himself on this mission? Unlocking the mysteries of establishing contact with the worlds of the rich and famous. The restaurant, the most exclusive and Raised in a middle-class suburb of London, Robin remembers wanting to work as a reporter from the time he was a child. He wrote articles in the U.S. for both the National Enquirer and the Star. In a tabloid style, he says, was present even in the first story he was ever assigned as a young reporter, a garden show. It's very interesting that the lead intro paragraph on those stories was the biggest cucumber, <laughs> the, la the largest cauliflower, so I guess a little of the razzle-dazzle was there. No, why are I you was fascinated it? by... I mean, you must have thought about that. It's, what, Wh celebrity wh status? Or yeah, or by the biggest cucumber or the largest cauliflower. Because I think that's what people want to know. You know, too often, the bus line tours in Hollywood take people around from out of town, and they show them the wall of the house of the star. And we just go marching right up the front drive throw the doors open and say, and the carpet cost $60,000. But Robin couldn't do that, of course, unless people who are rich and famous and often private cooperated with him. Why do they? I don't know. Maybe the accent because I'm a Cockney. There is a little bit of, you know, naive, innocent charm in all of this that I think I have, and I'm not being egotistical. I think that... I am, you know, the butler who is allowed upstairs from the basement to my lady's living room for afternoon tea, which is a little bit of what we're doing anyway. Sophia's prized possession is her 17th century bed. Ever curious, I asked if this was where her children were born. No, my children were born in a hospital. Uh, they were conceived there, maybe. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, Bob, it absolutely amazes me. I walk away from a shoot and I think, well, we did it again. Leach's viewers may be accustomed to glimpsing stars like Maud Adams lounging in intimate settings. I have, from what I'm told, the largest bed in the world. I walked in there and I wasn't really sure what I was supposed to do with it. But does Leach ever worry that he could be accused of pandering, both to the stars and the viewers? I don't think it is pandering so much as I think it is an interesting way for somebody to... Uh, in a sense, escape from the real world to find it bigger and better out there. It's why you'll never see on Lifestyles, and I j I've joked about this in the past, you'll never see it raining on my show. You will never see dead flowers on my show. Everything is always in full bloom. So the rich and famous know that Robin will display under flattering circumstances their lawns and lives well manicured, and that they may get to promote a favorite hobby or charity or even a property they've got up for sale. But what if Robin knew down deep that one of his subjects was a rotten person? 
would he go ahead and do a flattering profile? My show is not called Crucify the Rich and Famous or Attack the Rich and Famous. We had invitations to do the Duvaliers and the Marcuses well before those scandals broke. And I turned it down because morally, in my heart, I didn't believe that it was right. But I also couldn't have gone there and shot it and said, this is disgraceful. This should be stopped because that's not the editorial philosophy of our show. Nevertheless, in tracking down mega-materialism wherever it takes him, Leach has entered some politically sensitive areas. On one of his jet-setting expeditions, Robin pierced the Iron Curtain and somehow got the Soviet government not to destroy his tapes, showing that the Ruskies, too, have their little rich and famous secrets. Sarah Tully hits his favorite restaurant in downtown Tbilisi. Hang out for the local moneyed elite ski. This profile of Soviet artist Zurab Saratelli was one of Robin's most memorably written tributes to extravagance. Check out his private steam room and plunge pool. It must be a real rarity behind the Iron Curtain. I think one of the great lines in there, we found, we found this um, huge um, uh, suitcase-type portable radio lying in one of the gentleman's three apartments. Could his Western ghetto blaster make Joseph Stalin turn over in his grave? And I thought that was one of the more delightful lines of copy that I have ever had the joy of twisting around my mouth. <laughs> it's amusing. And I do know that the people at the Russian embassy here in New York regularly watch our show on Sunday nights. And that's even been reported in the New York Times. Chop, chop. Keeping up with Robin Leach is not the leisurely assignment you might imagine. We accompanied him on a trip to Nassau that had us arriving after 10 p.m., up at 7 a.m. the next day for breakfast, waiting for his celebrity guest, Alan Thicke, by 8 a.m., and then we headed off to a place called Salt Key before 9. Okay, let's go. This may eventually look as if he spent a couple of days in a lonely paradise with Thicke, but they did have lots of company, and they'll be out of here before sundown because Leach has to go to Rome via right. London tomorrow, and time is money. Let's go to work. Leach says he charges an average of $28,000 a month on his American Express card to cover production and travel expenses as well as his own. And every place he stops, he is out to maximize that investment. For instance, this interview is being shot for Runaway with the Rich and Famous. But don't be surprised if you also see parts of it on Lifestyles or Fame, Fortune, and Romance. And I see what he does. He edits you into a million pieces in a million different shows so that one week you're on Rich and Famous, another week you're poor and helpless, another week you're sick and tired and you're young and restless, and who knows what shows you're going to appear on if you do an interview with Robin. It's like ground chuck. But Robin doesn't ask his guests to do anything he wouldn't do. Before noon on this day, he had finished the interview with Thick and was in the process of taping his own introductions and closes to two of his three shows. Watch for the wardrobe magic. Thank you for joining us. I'm Robin Leach with Champagne Wishes and Caviar Dreams. From sea and sand, hotels to restaurants, from skiing to safaris, lifestyles of runaway with the rich and famous. You got it. Let's go change to fame fortune. <laughs> We don't carry wardrobe mistresses on our shoots. Not in the budget. Hi, I'm Robin Leach, and we invite you to share the private stories behind the public lives. I think this one will clash with your bathing suit. By a little afternoon, producer Deborah Bromberg had helped arrange a scene in which Alan and Robin would churn about a lagoon in paddle boats. But something was missing. Alan, this is Roxanne. Hi, Alan. So two women who happened to be there on tour were recruited to join the scene, even though they'd never actually met the stars before. Is this Robin Leach computer dating service? <laughs> but it was just before we left, about three and a half hours after we arrived, that we found out what one of the really prime tourist attractions was in the Bahamas that day. Hi, everybody. 
it was Robin Leach. And this is paradise for you to be filming on. You've you been here before, Beautiful island. Platinum paradise. So we can see that Robin qualifies as famous, but does he qualify as rich? Well, by his standards, you have to have at least $50 million to make that cutoff. He's not even close, but he does have a dream. No bones about it. There is nothing wrong in being rich in this country. And um, I shall be very angry if I'm not rich for having put all of this time and, and uh, labor into it. Um, I hope the show stays on long enough um, for me to be the last episode so I can thank you, you know, all for making me very rich. And even though Robin's current Manhattan apartment, somewhere near the half-million-dollar range, is only tasteful and modest by the standards of his own show, we couldn't resist asking him to give us a little preview of that fantasy final episode. Robin Leach doing Robin Leach. Everywhere you look, there are flowers that have been brought in personally by his staff of 50,000 farmers. And they're a collection of very impressive fish, rare fish mined from deep in the ocean. The ultimate luxury in a New York City bathroom. A shower that actually blows steam, rare steam, scented with oriental jasmine imported at great expense from the perfume fields of France. And tiles imported from Italy. Actually, they came from a store on Second Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> He's something else. Bob, how did Robin Leach anticipate this public interest in viewing the wealthy when a generation ago on television it was uh, Maud or Little House on the Prairie or other humbler settings? Well, this decade in particular, we seem to be obsessed uh, with that kind of uh, materialism and the uh, you are what you own sort of uh, mentality. The man who created the concept with Robin, Al Massini, said that he didn't think the show would have succeeded in the 60s, that it is a real product of the 80s. Remarkable. Thank you, Bob. Well, next, it sinks, it burns, and it costs over a million dollars a copy. It's what the Army calls an infantry fighting vehicle. And for those who have to ride in it, Tom Jarrell asks, are the soldiers safe? Right after this. Last summer, in our report, Are the Soldiers Safe? Tom Jarrell was one of the first to expose serious weaknesses and performance problems with what the Army calls an infantry fighting vehicle, the Bradley. At that time, the Pentagon said the Bradley was meeting its original requirements. But the Army wouldn't show us all of the test results. And to obtain them, we took the Army to court. Tonight, Tom reports on the outcome, and he also explains that a recent mishap with the Bradley proved fatal. The Bradley is the Army's newest tracked vehicle. It resembles a tank and was designed to move its crew to the front very quickly with its rapid-firing cannon and missile launcher. It can attack tanks. It's supposed to be amphibious, but critics say it's a death trap and will not survive a hit from a missile or a gun. To test its vulnerability, the Army fired live ammunition at the Bradley. They released this 1985 test footage to demonstrate that the Bradley suffered some damage from the shots, but basically it remained intact. Not so, said our sources, who witnessed the test. The results were devastating. We asked the Army for the complete videotape, and they refused, citing national security. So we took the Army to court, and this Monday they surrendered the tape. Judge the damage for yourself. A shot produced this fire inside the vehicle. As flames spread, the fuel and ammunition exploded. Army firefighters could not put out the blaze. More flames and more chain reactions inside the Bradley. These flames continued through the night, and the next day, the devastation was total. What would happen to a real nine-man crew if they had been inside this vehicle? And we found the Bradley could kill its crew in other ways. They were words reminiscent of wartime, the telegram, the knock at the door, the terrible news. I see the car, this car pull up, and this uh, man in a uniform comes out, and I go up to the door, and he says, do you have a brother named George Wilson in the Army? I said, yes. He says, well, I'm sorry to inform you, your brother George was killed in a training accident. George Wilson's mother was at work at the time. She was telephoned by her son. I said, Robbie, tell me what's wrong with George. And he said, Mom, George is dead. And it was just like somebody hit me with a brick in the face. I couldn't believe it. Private First Class George Wilson is the first admitted casualty from drowning in a Bradley fighting vehicle. Wilson was driving through this field in West Germany in March 
When his vehicle went into a large hole which was filled with water and ice, he was unable to get out of the driver's area. Wilson had grave reservations about the vehicle he was driving, his father. He said that Bradley was a piece of shit. And he said, if you push him too hard, the transmission dropped out. And if you took a penny and fling it around inside the turret, he said you'd rupture the fuel tank. How did he describe the personal risk to those using the Bradley? The only thing he didn't like was being a driver. He said, well, being a driver is like being in a dead sea. Wilson's death could have been prevented. In fact, 2020 has obtained documents which show that the military was aware of the hole that Wilson went into, but did not warn the soldiers and did not mark it. Another problem, according to investigators for Congressman John Dingell, the Bradley's unable to climb out of the kinds of streams and rivers that it would likely encounter in wartime. These tests showed what happened to the Bradley time and time again. But the Army claimed they were a success. The M2 was able to successfully climb ramps up to 40% in the clay soil, as required by the specifications document. Another requirement of the $1.5 million machine is an ability to swim across water. As demonstrated in this 1980 swim test at Fort Knox, this has been a continuing problem. In fact, three weeks ago, the Bradley sank again, this time at Fort Benning, Georgia, during a routine swim test. If it was big news to the nearby community, it was even bigger news to the Army. Days after this sinking, the Army halted all swimming of the vehicle worldwide until the cause of the sinking could be determined and fixed. Mm -hmm. Tom, in, in light of continuing evidence that this machine behaves as it does, what is the Army's attitude toward it now? Hugh, I guess it's a case of honest people having honest differences of opinion. The Army stands by this as a solid piece of machinery. They feel it's safe. It's the future for the infantrymen as far as they're concerned. Do they plan Congress to make any changes in it? Or? They do. They, by July, they expect to announce changes that may make it less explosive and less prone to burn. Congressional critics would like the whole thing abolished or at least sharp modifications made in it. Right. What about, but a guy died in it. What do they, what's the Army contends it? that was nothing more, Hugh, than a traffic accident. We find it interesting that this GI had, one, been complaining frequently to his family in the mail that the Bradley was dangerous, and two, he had even been injured in one in an accident earlier. Thank you, Tom. We'll be right back. Charlie Gibson blushes when he reads his mail. He's warm. A winner. Say good morning to a winning team, Charlie Gibson and Joan London, weekdays on Good Morning America. Where a woman of mixed blood took what was given. That's enough! She dared to take it all. Queenie, starting Sunday, May 10th. Three weeks ago in the Billionaire Boys Club, we told you the story of Joe Hunt, the leader of a group of young men, many of them sons of wealthy California businessmen. He stood trial there for killing a former business partner, Ron Levin. Levin's body was never found, and the defense maintains he's in hiding somewhere. Well, last week, Joe Hunt was convicted of first-degree murder and could receive the death penalty. What's more, Hunt will soon be tried in another murder case in which the body has been found. Well, now here's Ted Koppel with a word about tonight's Nightline. Ted? Hugh, there are hundreds of Americans working in Nicaragua. Does the U.S. government see them as aiding and abetting the enemy? And if not, why does the FBI keep them under surveillance? Hugh? Thank you, Ted. And that's 2020 for tonight. Thank you for being with us. Remember, we're in touch, so you be in touch. I'm Hugh Downs. And on behalf of Barbara and everyone here at 2020, good night. transcript of this or any 2020 broadcast, please send $3 to 2020 Transcripts, 2 John Street, New York, New York, 10038. This has been the ABC News Magazine, 2020. On the Disney Sunday movie, Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke in the delightful Disney classic, Mary Poppins, Sunday.